Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for coming to tonight's lecture, um, despite the pretty bad weather out there. Uh, my name is Noor Abdul Razak. I am a senior here at MIT with the MIT MSA. And we are pleased to bring Sayyid Aman Naqshawani here from the UK to talk about the misconceptions of Shia Islam. Um, we know sometimes that this issue can be a little sensitive, and so we just wanted to emphasize that the purpose of tonight is really just to promote unity and dialogue. And so, inshallah, all of us leaves here um, benefiting from this lecture. Um, just to give you a little overview uh, or background on Sayyid Ammar, uh, he earned a degree in psychology and law at the University of College of London. Having completed a diploma in modern political change in Britain from, London, from the London School of Economics, he then completed an MA in Islamic Studies at the Islamic College for Advanced Studies. Sayyid Ammar is currently completing um, the final year of his PhD on Islamic historiography at Exeter University. Um, and just to give you a brief overview of how tonight's lecture will go, um, we'll start with a 45-minute um, talk, and then he'll go into a 30-minute question and answer session to where you guys can write your questions down on the piece of papers that hopefully you guys have. If not, just let me know. And hopefully that way we can get a little more questions in um, um, by the end of the night. So uh, thank, uh, thank you, and please join me in welcoming Sayyid Ahmad. In a second, just let him continue. Just before I start, if you wouldn't mind uh, noting down what I've just uh, written on the blackboard, I thought I might get a whiteboard, what I suppose MIT prides itself on its uh, classic nature. So, uh, hopefully. Okay, uh, usage of the word Shia in the Quran, the tradition. Number two, Ibn Sabah, Jamal, Ghadir. Number three, theology. Number four, jurisprudence. Number five, Karbala stroke messianism. And I'm going to move here. The future of intra-faith dialogue. Okay, so I'll just repeat them again before I start. Usage of the word Shia and Quran and tradition. Number two, Ibn Saba, stroke Jamal, stroke Ghadir. Number three, theology. Number four, jurisprudence. Number five, Karbala and Messianism. Number six, the future of intra-faith dialogue. If I could just have a hands up when everybody completes their six points and then we can begin the discussion. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله Amma ba'ad, respected brothers and sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The discussion concerning misconceptions about Shia is a fundamental discussion in religious and secular thought and is therefore a discussion which affects each and every one of our lives.
a discussion with a historical basis, and a contemporary significance. Contemporary in the sense that the word Shia can be viewed on both the print and the visual media throughout the world today. That in many discussions of religion and politics, the word Shia is spoken of by many political commentators, especially relating to the schisms of the Middle East and the different problems between the countries of the Middle East and their external relations. For example, constantly in the news you may hear about the idea of the Shia of Karbala or the Shia of Najaf and the different civil wars that may have occurred in, over the last five or six years within Iraq. Likewise, you hear about the discussions of the Shia of Lebanon, the Shia of Iran and the relations between the Shia of Iran and those of America put forward the idea that the word Shia is listened to by many. Likewise, that the word Shia is instrumental in much of the political thought of the relationships between the Middle East and the Western world. And that's why if one were to only look at one of the books recently written by Vali Nasser, the book known as the Shia Revival, highlighting the idea that possibly more so in the last five years than at any time before have people become accustomed to the word Shia. In the past, one may have heard the word Muslim, but now the word Shia has become prevalent everywhere, highlighting a need for us to understand the very background of this word and the background of those who follow this ideology. That's why the operative word at the beginning of this discussion comes from the title that I've been given, Misconceptions. Throughout our lives, many human beings may come across one misconception or another. I may have a misconception about a member of my family, a misconception about a member of the community, a misconception about a political figure, or indeed a misconception about an ideology. Yet the most important aspect of any misconception is whether you remain stagnant with that misconception or whether you open yourself for dialogue surrounding that particular misconception. Because we know very well that there are two words which linguists may place alongside misconceptions. One word is the word prejudice, and the second is the word stereotype. And that a community which is full of misconceptions, or which prejudges people, or which is stereotypical, is a community that does not open its mind for free thought. Whereas Muslims within the audience will know very well that the Qur'an stresses on the idea of dialogue between different members of the community. For example, in chapter 49 of the Qur'an, verse 13, the verse comes forward and states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuha nas inna khalaqnaakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu, inna akramakum anda Allah hadqaakum. O mankind, we have created you from male and female, and from different races and tribes in order that you get to know one another. The idea being and postulated by Ali ibn Abi Talib in one of his famous lines when he says that the people are of two types. They are either your brothers in faith or your equals in humanity. I may have somebody who's of the same school as me in Islam or somebody who may come from a different school. I may have somebody of the same religion or somebody from a different religion. The aim of humanity shouldn't be that we build misconceptions without asking the members of that particular group whether our misconceptions are justified or no. As in, would you believe? There are certain people in certain schools in Islam who are told, don't speak to these people. They are good at debating. They may indoctrinate you. When a school tells you that, you have to get a bit worried. As in, a person should be confident with their knowledge when they follow a school. If somebody goes and tells you don't speak to them, they are like people X. They may not be believers, but they have strong opinions. Then it makes you think that, hold on, then why am I following your school if you don't allow me to play devil's advocate? A strong school in any religion is a school whose members should be allowed to play devil's advocate with their leaders. In order that all misconceptions are removed. And that's why if I were to tell you the number of misconceptions that I've heard, about the Shia within the Islamic world, some people would not believe. That's why when the question is asked, where do misconceptions come from? Sometimes misconceptions are very innocent, as in I may have heard something about a certain group. Innocently, I've taken it on board. I don't mean to fuel any arguments, but it's just that I remember someone telling me X about a group. I never went to read up further on it, and that was it. 
Sometimes a misconception is built with people who have an agenda. And that's where the problem lies about the misconceptions about any school in Islam. When people have an agenda and fuel it. Let me give you an example. I came out of my hotel room from one very famous Middle Eastern country. You know it very well. And when I came out, they actually, it was my last day and I was checking out. They gave me a package. Me, being Iraqi, thinking there's free goodies in here, for example. And so what happened was, as soon as I took this package, I opened it and there was a cassette within there. And I was thinking, well, what's this about? When I went home to listen to the lecture, the first line of the lecture said, this has been produced to tell you that the Shia revolution of 1979 was a kafir revolution. And that the Shia are all disbelievers. And that they are an equation to the Zionists. That particular Middle Eastern country, in three lines, had already given us so many misconceptions. One was political, the other was theological, another was religious. And therefore, what did you find? I thought to myself, supposing that I listen to this, it might not affect me. But how many innocent Muslims who come to this country for their pilgrimage will be affected when they go back home? And that's why you find so much hatred between Muslims is sometimes agitated not by the non-Muslim, but by the Muslims themselves. I remember Ali ibn Abi Talib saying, our enemies are not the Jews and the Christians. Our enemy is our own ignorance. And when there are misconceptions about any school in Islam, it stems from our own ignorance. And that's why even Vali Nasr, amongst others within the Shia revival, mentioned some very interesting points about common misconceptions about the Shia, which I'm sure some of you may have come across. He talks about how in Lebanon, there were certain non-Shia in Lebanon who believed that the Shia of Lebanon had tails. Now, I can assure you I don't have a tail. But there was this belief that the Shia are born with tails. And that therefore the Shia were made to look like animalistic figures rather than human beings. There's also a discussion that the Shia of Saudi Arabia spit in their food before they give it to you to eat. Those of you who had lunch with me today, I don't think saw me spit in their food. But I can assure you that there aren't Shia who will come forward and spit in your food. Likewise, the, the non-Muslims or the non-Shia of Pakistan used to believe that the Shia commemorate in Muharram Hussein by gathering together in a hall and committing adultery with each other. Would you believe? There was such a misconception that they gather in a hall, men and women together, they switch the lights off and they all commit adultery with each other. There was a belief in some of the Shia in other countries, in some of the non-Shia, who thought of this idea that the Shia perform taqiyya. Be careful when they talk to you. What's taqiyya? Taqiyya is that they lie to you whenever they talk to you. You can never tell if they really mean what they say. There's another misconception that the Shia believe Ali is God. There is that misconception that the whole Shia world, let's just say 250 million people, all believe Ali ibn Abi Talib is God. As in when somebody normally says that, they'll never say to you, you know, there's a small group who believe. No, Shia, Ali is God. You know very well it's only 1% or so who have such a belief. But they'll make it out as if it's a general belief. There's another misconception that the Shia are those who after their prayer begin to strike their hands three times. And they say, Khan al Amin, Khan al Amin, Khan al Amin. Which paraphrased is, Gabriel made a mistake, Gabriel made a mistake, Gabriel made a mistake. And that is also spread as a misconception. And therefore, what is our point? Our point is that we recognize that there is no problem having misconceptions, but there is a problem when you don't go to look to alleviate those misconceptions. I don't mind if somebody comes and tells me that, you know what, I never knew this about you. But what I would say is, but why didn't you go and ask one of the scholars about this issue? Why did you live for years on hearsay? There are scholars out there who you can email who will reply back to you. And that's why we begin our discussion by looking at the usage of the word Shia. Because this discussion, as you could see, will take six stages. And within the stages, hopefully, we'll be able not only to clarify the misconceptions, but hopefully come on issues where us as Muslims can either agree to agree or agree to disagree. First and foremost, the usage of the word Shia, if you can note the following down. The word Shia has been used in the Quran with its derivatives on six occasions. 
The first occasion, chapter 6, verse 59 of the Quran. The second, chapter 6, verse 165 of the Quran. The third, chapter 28, verse number 4. The fourth, chapter 28, verse number 15. The fifth, chapter 30, verse 31 to 32. And the sixth, chapter 37, verse 83. If I was to look at a couple of them, they'll define for us what the word Shia means. For example, chapter 37, verse 83 says, وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ لَإِبْرَاهِيمِ and from amongst his followers was Ibrahim. Here, therefore, the usage of the word Shia refers to the Prophet Abraham. Why? The idea here is given that the Prophet Abraham was amongst the followers of the Prophet Noah. In the order of the succession of the Prophets, Abraham, of course, follows Noah. And that the idea was that Abraham's principles were similar to Noah in that he was a prophet of God who brought a message of monotheism to his people. There were people who surrounded the both of them who did not necessarily believe in that which they believe in. Both of them had trouble with the people of their time. As in Noah, the Quran mentions for over 950 years was trying to preach the message of God. And the Quran says the people in some cases or the majority of cases would not listen to him. They would come and bring their fingers and they would stick them into their ears. And that he tried and he would try until eventually the whole incident of the flood occurred. Likewise with the prophet Abraham, the Quran mentions the story that Abraham was living in a time of idol worshippers, where his own uncle was an idol worshipper. He was brought up by his uncle, after many narrations say his father had passed away at a young age, and this uncle of his used to carve the idols. Abraham witnesses the creation of the sun, the moon and the stars, and therefore comes to the conclusion of the belief in the oneness of God and goes about trying to debate the idol worshippers about how idol worship is the biggest form of oppression both to a human being and towards God. Therefore you found that the word Shia was used min shi'atihi, and from his followers was Ibrahim. That's one example. Then Shia could have a second meaning, the party of. Some would say follower, party, isn't it the same thing? Not necessarily. A follower may be someone who follows your exact message. A party may be someone who's of your people. And therefore, he's someone you collectively associate with. In Surah 28 verse 15, one of the references which I gave you. فَوَجَدَ فِيهَا رَجُلَيْنِ يَقْتَتِلَانِ هَذَا مِنْ شِيْعَتِهِ وَهَذَا مِنْ عَدُوِّهِ Prophet Moses walks through town, he sees two men fighting. One of them was the cook of Pharaoh. The other was from the children of Israel. One of them is an Egyptian. The other is an Israelite. Who obviously would be from the Shia of Musa? It would be the Israelite, because Musa is an Israelite, but brought up in an Egyptian household. The Quran came forward and said, هَذَا مِنْ شِيَعَتِهِ one of them is of his Shia and the other one is of his enemies. Why? Because of his enemies, Moses was brought up in the court of Pharaoh. Yet Pharaoh used to believe, I am God, Anna, Rabbukum al A'la, I am the Lord the Most High. Even though he was brought up in his house, does not mean he is one of his followers. Yet once again, the word Shia is defined by these two. That whenever anybody comes to you and says, what's the meaning of the word Shia? It means the party of or the follower of. Can the word Shia be next to somebody in opposition to the current Shia? Of course it can. Because if the word Shia means party or follower, I could say the Shia of Hussein for the Shia of Yazid. Do you understand the point? And that's why the schism over the Shia of Kufa killing Hussein is a very wrong interpretation. How many times have you heard from people saying, it was you Shia who killed Hussein? Are you feeling guilty? I defy anyone historically to show me a single Shia in the meaning of the word which we're going to come to in our analysis. 
in the meaning of the idea of prophet and infallibles who succeed him and the belief in Hussein as the third of those infallibles. I defy anyone to show me a single Kufan who believed in the Hussein as the third infallible who killed Hussein. Shia of Hussein, because many ask this question, then what was the Shia of Hussein? The Shia of Hussein were two types. Were those who either believed Hussein was the third infallible, which I'm going to come to in a moment, or were those who said, we are your party who are against Yazid. Hence the words could be used as Shia. I am from the party that's against Yazid. Did Yazid have Shia? Yes, of course he did. Because again, the Arabic word Shia is taken from the party of Hussein, and you see the Shia of Yazid. That's why Hussein, while he's on the ground, in his final moments before he dies, he makes a statement where he uses this word Shia before he even passes away. He's on the ground. The opposition leader says, is he dead or is he alive? The grandson of the prophet is on the ground. Arrows surround his body. They are not certain if he's dead or if he's alive. One of the leaders from the opposition, Shimr bin Dil Joshan, came forward and said, to know if he's dead or if he's alive, shout out, we're going to attack his woman. Because a true warrior will not lay on the ground while his women are being attacked. Hussein, the narration says, is on the ground. He tries to stand up, he falls. He tries to stand up, he falls. Then he calls out, O Shia of Abu Sufyan. Listen to the wording. O Shia of Abu Sufyan. Even, and then later on he says, O Shia of Yazid. Even. If you don't believe in a day of judgment, then at least be free men in your worship. Don't go and attack innocent women who have done nothing wrong to you. Notice the wording. He takes the word Shia and completely transfers it to the opposition. Highlighting that Shia does not necessarily mean a religious connotation. It could be an individual world, word which refers to a group of people. Move on to number two. Ibn Saba, Jamal al Ghadir. So, when did these Shia begin? As in, if you were to ask somebody now, these Shia who exist in the world today, when did they begin? You find that there are three main arguments as to when the Shia began. The first involves a very interesting man by the name of Abdullah ibn Saba. Abdullah ibn Saba is seen by many non Shia. I say quite unfortunately, as being the originator of what 250 million people follow in the world. How? They say that Shi'ism began from a Yemeni Jew. So the whole of the belief of the Muslims who are Shia today is from a Yemeni Jew. That's the one who taught them all of their principles. So when 15 million people go to Karbala every year, it's because of a Yemeni Jew. He's the one who laid down the structure for them. This Abdullah ibn Saba, what was his original name? Abdullah ibn Saba ibn Shamon. His father was called Shamon. His mother, very important when we come to study context in a moment, was called Sauda. Hence, some people called him Ibn Saba, some called him Ibn Sauda. This person, his father, Saba, was one of those people who conspired to kill the second Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab. They had got together and they conspired to kill the second Khalifa. When Uthman ibn Affan, the third Khalifa, came in, he ordered that those who conspired to kill Umar ibn al-Khattab had to be caught. Amongst the people who was caught was a person by the name of Harumaz al-Majusi. Harumaz al-Majusi. When Harumaz al-Majusi was caught, this is what the tradition says. Of course, it's not my opinion on the issue. It says, Haruman al-Majusi, when he was caught, Abdullah, the son of Saba, became angry. And therefore, this Abdullah bin Saba converted to Islam, not because he believed in Islam. No, because he wanted to get within the status quo. He left Judaism, yet he was still really someone who was Jewish. He got into the religion of Islam, and what did he begin doing? He began causing the companions of the Holy Prophet to have schisms between each other. Because as we know, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari and Uthman ibn Affan did not get on with each other at all. That's a very well-known fact. 
And so therefore, Abdullah ibn Sabah was to blame for this. Ammar ibn Yasir, when he spoke out against Uthman ibn Affan, again the reply was, Abdullah ibn Sabah was the cause of this. Abdullah ibn Sabah was the cause again of the killing of Uthman ibn Affan according to the school. Abdullah ibn Sabah was also the man who formulated the Shia that we see today according to this school. Why? Because they say Abdullah ibn Sabah used to raise the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib to divinity. To divinity. When he started to raise Ali ibn Abi Talib's position to divinity, they say that he is the man who would tell people, look, fight with Ali ibn Abi Talib and fight in defending him against the mother of the believers, Aisha, against Talha and against Zubair. And that later historians would say the companions loved each other. There was no problem between them. It was a Yemeni Jew who caused all the friction. Later on, they say that Abdullah ibn Sabah began Shi'ism, that he was the first Shi'a of Ali. This argument is an absolutely absurd argument. And within the academic world, it's been denounced by many already. Those who want references can either go towards Yitzhak Naqash's discussion on this issue, or can go towards Taha Hussein's discussion on the issue, where they both come forward and say it's an absurd idea which is normally brought up to try and bring the Shia's principles down. Abdullah ibn Sabah, who began him, as in who narrates him? Saif ibn Umar al-Tamimi. Saif ibn Umar al-Tamimi, according to Imam al-Nasai, amongst others, according to Yahya ibn Mu'in, amongst others, according to Al-Hakim and Nisapuri, within the Mustadrak al-Sahihain, all of them come forward and say he is not a reliable narrator. To the extent that some of them come forward and say he's a fabricator. Some of them come forward and say he's a liar. Saif ibn Umar al-Tamimi isn't just rejected as a narrator by the world of the Shia. The Sunni schools narrate him, come forward and say that his narrations are to be taken as fabrications. Number one. Number two, did a man exist by Abdullah ibn Sabah? In my opinion, yes. A man did exist but not the man who formed the Shia. So who was the man who existed? There were three men, according to the chronicles of history, who were given the title Abdullah ibn Sabah. Let me explain who they are. The first of them led the Khawarij fighting Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Nahrawan. Note that down, please. Ali ibn Abi Talib faced three civil wars when he became Khalifa. Ironic, if I say so myself. The first was Jamal, the second was Safin, the third was Nahrawan. The same people who had fought with him at Badr and Uhud came back later on to fight against him. What we find was that at Nahrawan, the leader of the army against Ali ibn Abi Talib was Abdullah ibn Sabah. Number one, if you are the leader against Ali ibn Abi Talib, how you form the Shia, only God knows. Number two, there was another man by the name of Abdullah ibn Wahab al Sabai. Note that down. Abdullah ibn Wahab. Al-Saba'i. Abdullah bin Wahab al-Saba'i, the narrations say he came from the town known as Madain. And he came to Ali ibn Abi Talib. One narration says Ali ibn Abi Talib was on his horse one day. He was traveling. He saw this man eating. And he said to him, it's the holy month of Ramadan. Why are you eating? He said to him, you are as you are. He said to him, what do you mean? He said, I believe that you are God. Astaghfirullah. When he said that, as soon as he said that, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the narration says, came down from the horse. He put his cheeks on the ground. And he said, I've been created from clay by the Lord. And he ordered this person that if him and his followers do not stop in their heretic ways, they will all be punished. Because in Islam, to claim that a human being is God is seen as the most worst of oppressive acts towards the religion. Therefore, Abdullah ibn Wahab al-Sabai could not be the formulator of the Shia because there is not a single Shia in terms of the mainstream who believe that Ali ibn Abi Talib is God. Number three, and I agree with Dr. Shaibi's PhD in Baghdad. A very interesting PhD for those of you who want to go even deeper into this discussion. Dr. Shaibi wrote a PhD in Baghdad University titled The 15 Proofs that Ibn Saba was Ammar ibn Yasir. Ibn Saba was Ammar ibn Yasir.
Now I'm gonna, he's got 15 proofs. I just want to give you a hint why. Ibn Sabat's mother, what's her name? I said, what was her name? Soda. Soda literally means what in English? Darker complexion, let's say. Ammar ibn Yasser's mother was whom? Sumayya. Sumayya had a darker complexion. In Safin, Amr ibn al-As does not call Ammar ibn Yasser by his name. He calls him Ibn Sauda. Why? Because there is a problem if you call Ammar by his name. Because the hadith was there, Ammar taqtilu kal fi'atil baghiyah. Ammar, you will be killed by infidels. If Amr ibn al-As says Ammar, then the narrators will straight away say that if you are fighting Ammar, then what does that put you in? And it actually happened because Muawiyah was not as careful. Muawiyah and the narration said Ammar ibn Yasir. When his companions heard, they said, Ammar ibn Yasir is on the opposition because Ammar ibn Yasir on the day of Safin was 93 years old. The companions said he's in the opposition. The reply was yes. They said, Rasulullah said, Ammar Ammar will be killed by infidels. Muawiyah said, we aren't the infidels. Why? He said, it's Ali ibn Abi Talib who has killed him, not us. Why? He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib brought him to war. So he's the one who's killed him. To which the reply by Ali ibn Abi Talib was, that means Rasulullah killed Hamza because he brought him to war. The point was what? Amr ibn al-As was saying, Ibn al-Sawda. Ibn al-Sawda, Ammar ibn Yasser, according to Dr. Shaibi, is Ibn al-Sawda. Because of the fact that the, one of the men who rose vehemently against Uthman ibn Affan, according to narrations, was Ammar ibn Yasser. Therefore, on the first level, did Abdullah ibn Sabah begin the Shia? No. Let's move that. Number two, Jamal. Some academics say, the first usage of the word Shia of Ali was in the Battle of Jamal. The Battle of Jamal was fought by whom? Uthman ibn Affan got killed. Three wanted vengeance. Actually, I could say thousands wanted. But three, let's just say, were the main ones who wanted vengeance. Talha, Zubair, and Aisha. They wanted vengeance. They said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, if you don't find the killers, then we're going to have to fight you. Ali ibn Abi Talib replied by saying, I have just been instilled as Khalifa. To find the killers is not something I can do overnight. It requires a proper courtroom where we bring everyone together. They said the killers are on your side and we're going to fight you. Academics come forward and say, the first Shia were those who helped Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Jamal. Who were they? They said the first Shia were people like Malik al-Ashtar, Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, names along those lines, who were seen as the Shia, meaning the party of Ali against Aisha at Jamal. Therefore, the second school came and said what? The first time the word Shia was ever used in terms of the battlefield was in this area. The third group is seen as being the strongest. That the Shia were those who held on to the belief that Ali ibn Abi Talib was the person announced as successor of the Prophet Muhammad before the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, passed away. This is the Shia mainstream. What do they say? They look at a hadith by the name of Hadith al Ghadir. If you note know down the following reference, in Sahih Muslim, volume 2, page 880. The abridged version, not the complete version, the abridged version, Darus Salam publishes, 2002 edition. Volume 2, page 880, abridged version, 2002 edition. If you go to that narration, it says, Zayd ibn Arqam is the, main in the man in the chain of the narration. He is asked by the companions, what happened when the Holy Prophet was on his farewell pilgrimage? Now here is a typical example of a Shia using what is known as a classic Sunni reference. But of course the references can go further than this. Zayd says we stopped at a place which was an oasis by the name of Khum. 
Hence, you'll see many Shia refer to this incident by saying, our origin is Ghadir Khum. We stopped at a place by the name of Khum. The Holy Prophet came forward in front of everybody and he came forward and he said, O oh people, he began to give the whole sermon until he reached the line that I am leaving behind for you two things which if you hold on to them, you will never go astray. This is Muslim's narration. The Quran, and then he says, My Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt, three times. The question then asked is, Who are your Ahlul Bayt? The reply was, The followers of Ali. That's the narration which is there in Muslim. Therefore, you found that the incident of Ghadir is where many Shia states was the first usage of this idea that Ali and his Shia, those who hold on to the belief that Ali ibn Abi Talib was appointed successor before the Prophet Muhammad passes away, the Shia today are seen as being those. Because you know Shia, there are groups, Zaydis, Ismailis, Ithna Asharis. And we can go so deep into each one of them, Zaydi, Ismail, and Ashari's, but suffice for us to say that of those three groups of Shia, of which the Ithna Ashari's are 85%, suffice for us to say that each one of them takes Ghadir as authentic. Then why is it that other Muslims don't? There's not a single Muslim who doesn't believe in the incident of Ghadir, but they differ over the interpretation of the word Mawla. The Holy Prophet is meant to have said before he passes away according to the Shia and according to other schools. But the difference is how do you interpret the word Mawla? According to the Shia, the Prophet says, you know in Arabic grammar, those of you who have studied Arabic grammar will know very well the word Qarina. Qarina means context. One word in Arabic can have 20 meanings, true? One word can have so many meanings. If you don't place the word in context, you're all over the place. It's like in English, you can have a number of words which can have a number of meanings. The word, for example, such as lion. If I say Alexander is the lion of the seas, of course it differs depending on context, the meaning of the word lion. The Prophet Muhammad